Hi, thanks for tuning in to the Catholic Family Podcast. You're listening to episode one of a new show here on the channel called The Children of Our Lady Podcast. My name is Thomas, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the pilot episode here of the new show. Now, the goal of this show, The Children of Our Lady Podcast, is to help spread devotion to our Blessed Mother Mary. And in order to do this, I think it's so important to hear what the saints and holy fathers have to say about Our Lady and devotion to her, how they speak about her life, and see how we can learn from it and implement devotion to Mary in our lives. And in order to give the listeners a better understanding of what to expect from the Children of Our Lady podcast, I want to briefly explain the two different types of formats you'll typically see from the show, that being with an interview and that being without an interview. Now, today will be the more common type. That's one without an interview. But regardless of the format of the episode, each one I want to take a listen to a good reading from a book on Our Lady, an approved book on Our Lady, whether it's True Devotion to Mary, The Glories of Mary, The Secret of the Rosary, etc., and talk about it. Now, as a layman, I recognize my limitations here, so that's where the second format of the show comes into play, that being one with an interview, more specifically an interview with a priest. And in those episodes, we hope to have priests come on the show where together we can take a listen to a reading from a book on Our Lady and talk about its contents in a more in-depth way to hear the priest's explanations of the different virtues that were on display or the story in which we read to give a more in-depth commentary about what we listen to. And maybe to hear from them, maybe their own personal experiences of how the intercession, the powerful intercession of Our Lady personally affected their lives. There are many different ideas I have about doing shows with the priest, whether we do a series on the virtues of Our Lady or go through each of the mysteries of her life. Definitely a lot of exciting ideas that I hope can come to fruition. But until then, as in today's show and in all those ones without an interview, the main focus will just be on the reading from a good book about Our Lady with some brief commentary afterwards, a short passage from one of the Holy Fathers or a saint, an additional quote, and a concluding prayer to Our Blessed Mother. Now, a show like this is one I hope will appeal to all of our listeners, whether young or old, married or single, whether you're a convert or a cradle Catholic, whether you're bound to the fast or not. And this isn't just because of the way we provide this content about Our Lady, but rather because devotion to Mary is for all of us. And one of the aspects of devotion to Our Lady that I know I myself for so long overlooked and didn't really take into my heart is that truth that is the truth that Mary is our mother, our spiritual mother. And once you truly accept that into your heart, the changes that come from it can be truly remarkable. And so, where do we start? Well, in every episode, whether we have an interview or not, I want to take a listen to a good reading from a book on Our Lady. And the book I want to start with is one that will hopefully not only motivate us and edify us to grow in devotion to Our Lady, but help us to understand that truth better, that Mary is truly our spiritual mother and that she cares for us all as her own dear children. And I think there's no better book to start with in order to accomplish that than The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguori. Now, this is a book I began listening to last summer via audiobook, and it turned out to be one of the most beautiful books I have ever read, or listened to, if we're being technical. And I feel one of the things that so many people may only know about The Glories of Mary is that it is a very large book, and sometimes I know, this can be the case for myself, that we may see a larger book, it might be a little harder to undertake, but I found that in this book there are so many treasures, so many amazing ways that St. Alphonsus Liguori sp- explains truths about Our Lady in just a way that's very practical, very understanding. And I think that a lot of people may not have heard them or have only had heard them in bits and pieces. And I hope that here on this show, we can go through the book together, if not in its entirety, maybe a little bit here and there, depending on what the topic of our show may be, just kind of bouncing around the book. But the point is, is that the glories of Mary, I'd like to make to make it that main source of subject material. Whether we have interviews or not, or whether it's just simple readings, I think that The Glories of Mary is a great book, a great place to start to help us know and love Our Lady more. And I know this intro has gone on a little bit long, though I did expect that with it being the first episode of the show, but I don't want to spend any more time with the buildup. I'd really like to get into this masterpiece, which is The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguori. And we're going to start with the introduction. I feel like in a journey like this that I feel this book will be for many. It's important to start from the very beginning, where St. Alphonsus makes some very important remarks and clarifications, and even just in his introduction, and he has a beautiful prayer to our Lord and Our Lady, which just in itself is very moving and edifying. So without any further ado, we'll go ahead and take a listen to the reading, 
We'll come back for a little bit more commentary, hear a quote, and conclude with a prayer. The Author's Protest In obedience to the decrees of Urban VIII, I declare that I have no intention of attributing any other than a purely human authority to the miracles, revelations, favors, and particular cases recorded in this book, and the same as regard the titles of saints and blessed, applied to the servants of God not yet canonized, except in those cases which have been confirmed by the Holy Roman Catholic Church and the Apostolic See, of which I declare myself to be an obedient son, and therefore I submit myself, and all that I have written in this book, to her judgment. The Author's Prayer to Jesus and Mary My most loving Redeemer and Lord Jesus Christ, I, thy miserable servant, well knowing what pleasure he gives thee who endeavors to exalt thy most holy mother, whom thou lovest so much, knowing too how much thou desirest to see her loved and honored by all, have determined to publish this work of mine, which treats of her glories. I know not, however, to whom I could better recommend it than to thee, who hast her glory so much at heart. To thee, therefore, do I dedicate and commend it. Accept this little homage of the love I bear thee and thy beloved mother. Do thou protect it, by showering down on all who read it the light of confidence and flames of love towards this Immaculate Virgin, in whom thou hast placed the hope, and whom thou hast made the refuge of all the redeemed. And as a reward for my poor labor, grant me, I beseech thee, that love towards Mary, which, by the means of this book, I desire to see enkindled in all who read it. And now I turn to thee, O my most sweet lady and mother Mary. Thou well knowest that, after Jesus, I have placed my entire hope of salvation in thee, for I acknowledge that everything good, my conversion, my call to renounce the world, and all the graces that I have received from God, all were given me through thy means. Thou knowest that in order to see thee loved by all as thou deservest, and also as some mark of gratitude for the many benefits thou hast conferred upon me, I have always endeavored in my sermons, in public and in private, to insinuate into all thy sweet and salutary devotion. I hope to continue doing so until my last breath, but my advanced years and feeble health admonish me that I am near the end of my pilgrimage and my entry into eternity, and therefore I wish, before dying, to leave this book to the world, in order that in my place it may continue to preach thee and encourage others to announce thy glories and the tender compassion thou showest to thy clients. I trust, my most beloved queen, that this little gift, which is one of love, though far beneath thy merits, will yet be acceptable to thy most gracious heart. Extend, then, that most sweet hand with which thou hast drawn me from the world and delivered me from hell, and accept it and protect it as thy own. But at the same time, thou must know that I expect a reward for my little offering, and that is, that from this day forward I may love thee more than ever, and that every one into whose hands this work may fall may at once be inflamed with love of thee, and that his desire of loving thee and of seeing thee loved by others, may be increased, so that he may labor with all affection to preach and promote, as far as he can, thy praises and confidence in thy most powerful intercession. Amen. Thy most loving, though vile servant, Alphonsus de Liguori. To the reader, in order that my present work may not be condemned by the overcritical, I think it well to explain certain propositions that will be found in it, and which may seem hazardous, or perhaps obscure. I have noticed some, and should others attract your attention, charitable reader, I beg that you will understand them according to the rules of sound theology and the doctrine of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, of which I declare myself a most obedient son. In the introduction, at page 7, referring to the sixth chapter of this work, I say that it is the will of God that all graces should come to us by the hands of Mary. Now, this is indeed a most consoling truth for souls tenderly devoted to our most blessed lady, and for poor sinners who wish to repent. Nor should this opinion be looked upon as contrary to sound doctrine, since the father of theology, St. Augustine, in common with most writers, says that Mary cooperated by her charity in the spiritual birth of all members of the church. A celebrated writer, and one who cannot be accused of exaggeration or of misguided devotion, says that it was, properly speaking, on Mount Calvary that Jesus formed his church. And then it is evident that the Blessed Virgin cooperated in a most excellent and especial manner in the accomplishment of this work. And in the same way it can be said that though she brought forth the head of the church, Jesus Christ, without pain, she did not bring forth the body of this head without very great suffering. And so it was on Mount Calvary that Mary began in an especial manner to be the mother of the whole church. And now, to say all in a few words, 
God, to glorify the mother of the Redeemer, has so determined and disposed that of her great charity she should intercede in behalf of all those for whom his divine Son paid and offered the superabundant price of his precious blood in which alone, quote, is our salvation, life, and resurrection, end quote. On this doctrine, and on all that is accordance with it, I ground my propositions. Propositions which the saints have not feared to assert in their tender colloquies with Mary and fervent discourses in her honor. Hence, St. Sophronius says that the plentitude of all grace which is in Christ came into Mary, though in a different way, meaning that the plentitude of grace was in Christ, as the head from which it flows, as from its source, and in Mary as in the neck through which it flows. This opinion is clearly confirmed and taught by the angelic doctor, St. Thomas, who says, Of the three ways in which the Blessed Virgin is full of grace, the third is that she is so for its transfusion into all men. And then he adds, This plentitude is great in any saint, where there is as much grace as would suffice for the salvation of many, but it is in its highest degree when there is as much as would suffice for the salvation of the world. And it was in this degree in Christ and in the Blessed Virgin. For in all dangers thou canst obtain salvation of this glorious Virgin. And therefore it is said in the sacred canticles that a thousand bucklers, that is to say, means of protection against dangers, hang upon it. Also in every work of virtue thou canst have her for thy helper. For she says in the words of Ecclesiastes, In me is all hope of life and virtue. Introduction, which it is necessary to read. My beloved reader and brother in Mary, since the devotion that led me to write and moves you to read this book makes us happy children of the same good mother, should you hear it remarked that I might have spared myself the labor, as there are already so many celebrated and learned works on the same subject, I beg that you will reply in the words of the abbot Francone that, quote, the praise of Mary is an inexhaustible fount. The more it is enlarged, the fuller it gets, and the more you fill it, so much the more it is enlarged. In short, this Blessed Virgin is so great and so sublime, that the more she is praised, the more there remains to praise. So much so, says an ancient writer, that if all the tongues of men were put together, and even if each of their members was changed into a tongue, they would not suffice to praise her as much as she deserves. I have seen innumerable works of all sizes which treat of the glories of Mary, but finding that they were either rare, voluminous, or did not answer the object I had in view, I endeavored to collect from as many authors as I could lay my hands on the choicest passages extracted from fathers and theologians, and those which seemed to me to be the most to the point, and have put them together in this book in order that the devout may, with little trouble and expense, be able to inflame themselves with the love of Mary, and more particularly to furnish priests with matter for their sermons, wherewith to excite others to devotion towards this Divine Mother." Worldly lovers often speak of and praise those whom they love, in order that the object of their affections may be praised and extolled by others. There are some who pretend to be lovers of Mary, and yet seldom either speak of or endeavor to excite others to love her. Their love cannot be great. It is not thus that true lovers of this amiable lady act. They desire to praise her on all occasions, and to see her loved by the whole world, and never lose an opportunity, either in public or private, of enkindling in the hearts of others those blessed flames of love with which they themselves burn towards their beloved queen. That everyone may be persuaded how important it is, both for his own good and that of others, to promote devotion towards Mary, it is useful to know what theologians say on the subject. St. Bonaventure says that those who make a point of announcing to others the glories of Mary are certain of heaven, and this opinion is confirmed by Richard of St. Lawrence, who declares that to honor this queen of angels is to gain eternal life. And he adds that this most gracious lady will honor in the next world those who honor her in this. And who is ignorant of the promise made by Mary herself in the words of Ecclesiastes to those who endeavor to make her known and loved below? Quote, they that explain me shall have life everlasting, end quote. For this passage is applied to her by the church in the office of the Immaculate Conception. Rejoice, then, exclaims St. Bonaventure, who did so much to make the glories of Mary known. Rejoice, my soul, and be glad in her, for many good things are prepared for those who praise her. And he says that the whole of the sacred scriptures speak in praise of Mary. Let us therefore always, with our hearts and tongues, honor this Divine Mother, in order that we may be conducted by her into the kingdom of the blessed. We learn from the revelations of St. Bridget that the blessed Bishop Amingo was in the habit of always beginning his sermons with the praises of Mary. 
One day the Blessed Virgin herself appeared to the saint, and desired her to tell him that in consequence of his pious practice, she would be his mother, that he would die a holy death, and that she would herself present his soul to God. He died like a saint in the act of praying, and in the most heavenly peace. Mary also appeared to a Dominican friar, who always concluded his sermons by speaking of her, when on his deathbed the Blessed Virgin defended him from the devils, consoled him, and then she herself carried off his happy soul. The devout Thomas A. Kempis represents us Mary recommending a soul who had honored her to her son, and saying, My most loving son, have mercy on the soul of this servant of thine, who loved and extolled me. Next, as to the advantage of this devotion for all, St. Anselm says that as the most sacred womb of Mary was the means of salvation for sinners, the hearing of her praises must necessarily convert them, and thus also be a means of their salvation. How can it be otherwise than that the salvation of sinners should come from the remembrance of her praises, whose womb was made the way through which the Savior came to save sinners? And if the opinion is true, and I consider it as indeputable so, as I shall show in the sixth chapter, that all graces are dispensed by Mary, and that all who are saved are saved only by the means of this Divine Mother, it is a necessary consequence that the salvation of all depends upon preaching Mary, and exciting all to confidence in her intercession. It is well known that it was thus that St. Bernardine of Siena sanctified Italy, and that St. Dominic converted so many provinces. St. Louis Bertrand never omitted in his sermons to exhort all to love Mary, and how many others have done the same. I find that Father Paul Signeri the Younger, who was a very celebrated missioner, in every mission preached a sermon on devotion to Mary, and always called it his beloved sermon. And in our own missions, in which it is an inviolable rule to do the same, we can attest with all truth that in most cases no sermon is more profitable or produces so much compunction in the hearts of the people as the one on the mercy of Mary. I say on her mercy, for in the words of St. Bernard, we praise her virginity, we admire her humility, but because we are poor sinners, mercy attracts us more and tastes sweeter. We embrace mercy more lovingly, we remember it oftener, and invoke it more earnestly. And for this reason, I here leave other authors to describe the other prerogatives of Mary, and confine myself, for the most part, to that of her mercy and powerful intercession. Having collected as far as I was able, and with the labor of many years, all that the Holy Fathers and the most celebrated writers have said on the subject, and as I find that the mercy and power of the Most Blessed Virgin are admirably portrayed in the prayer Salve Regina, the recital of which is made obligatory for the greater part of the year on all the clergy, secular and regular, I shall divide and explain this most devout prayer in separate chapters. In addition to this, I thought that I should be giving pleasure to Mary's devout clients by adding discourses on the principal festivals and virtues of this Divine Mother, and by placing at the end of the work the devotions and pious practices most used by her servants and most approved of by the Church. Devout reader, should this work, as I trust it will, prove acceptable to you, I beg that you will recommend me to the Blessed Virgin, that she may give me great confidence in her protection. Ask this grace for me, and I promise you, whoever you may be, that I will ask the same for you who do me this charity. O oh, blessed are they who bind themselves with love and confidence to these two anchors of salvation, Jesus and Mary. Certainly they will not be lost. Let us then both say, devout reader, with the pious Alphonsus Rodriguez, Jesus and Mary, my most sweet loves, for you may I suffer, for you may I die. Grant that I may be in all things yours, and in nothing mine. Let us love Jesus and Mary, and become saints. We can neither expect nor hope anything better. Farewell, then, until we meet in paradise, at the feet of this most sweet mother, and of this most loving son, there to praise them, to love them face to face for all eternity. Amen. Okay, and that's where we'll stop with the readings for today. Wow. It's very moving to hear the way St. Alphonsus Liguori speaks, especially at the part at the end, when he refers to being together in heaven with him, and of course, our Lord and Our Lady. And what a thought that is. A very beautiful and inspiring thought to think about seeing Our Lord and Our Lady face to face. To enjoy what the blessed in heaven enjoy each and every moment. The beatific vision. To see God clearly. And then to be able to see Mary. I hope that I and everyone else listening will be there someday. 
And one thing that's very meaningful that I take away from the end part, too, is just to hear how St. Alphonsus speaks to us like friends. And I know we all look at the saints. We should look at the saints as our friends. And they're praying for us that we may be with them one day and become saints ourselves. But in this specific case with St. Alphonsus, I just find it very, it's very sweet to think about being there with him, that he's made it. He's there. He sees our king. He sees our queen. And he's praying for us. He's praying for you. He's praying for me. And I think it's a good reminder for all of us as we labor here below in the Valley of Tears to remember the reward that awaits us if we persevere in our faith, we do the will of God, we follow his commandments, we avoid sin, a reward we can't comprehend. And really, as we go through the spiritual life and, and form a more intimate union with our Lord and Our Lady, those thoughts of seeing them face to face can be rather emotional, obviously, in a good way, but to think about the ones that you you talk to every day, you ask for help every day, but you can't quite see them with your own two eyes. Just what a victory that must truly be for souls when they make it to heaven. Even the souls in purgatory, though they have to suffer for a while, they know that the reward is coming. And we as the church militant here below, we should stay confident and continue to pray to our Lord, pray to Our Lady for all the different helps that we need and, and never give up bearing our crosses and we should never take our faith for, for granted. Think about so many people in the world who are misguided, who just don't have the faith. Or even people out there who do, but don't have mass, don't have the sacraments. Maybe some of you who are listening have that. It's just a good reminder to always be grateful for our faith. And never take any day that God gives us for granted. And as we continue to strive to reach that ultimate goal, to get to heaven, never forget that sure means of going to our Lord, which this book will help us help us to understand what St. Alphonsus through his readings, and hopefully in every episode throughout the show, we can better understand that that sure means of getting to our Lord is through Mary, our Blessed Mother. So I think that's a good place to wrap it up for our first episode here at the Children of Our Lady podcast. I want to thank everybody who came by to listen, and I ask for prayers, especially for a show like this that's centered on spreading devotion to Our Lady. Well, obviously we know that That'd be the last thing that the devil wants is more devotion to Our Lady out there in the world. But that's something we know we desperately need. And I'll say I'm just so excited to get into future readings from this book, The Glories of Mary. And I, I hope that it does a lot of what it did for me for other people. And that's just truly uplift us all and motivate us all to go and be more devoted to Our Lady. And like I said, before we conclude, I'd like to read a short little quote or passage. But before we do that, I would like to ask for prayers, not just for this show in particular, but obviously for the entire Catholic Family Podcast, for Father Zepeda and the Catholic Wire, and for all the traditional Catholic apostolates that are actively working to try and spread the true Catholic faith. It's definitely a dangerous time in our world, so we need our faith, we need to cling to our faith, strive to live our faith. And it's obviously so important to spread the faith. So pray for all of those who are trying to do it publicly, but obviously we can all do it personally in our own private lives by just being a good example to all those that we come in contact with so that hopefully more souls can come to the true church of our Lord. And the quote or short passage that I'd like to read today comes from a different book, True Devotion to Mary by St. Louis de Montfort, and it actually comes from Father Faber's preface. I'm sure some of you have heard this before, but I think it's very fitting, especially for the first episode of this show, and it reads as follows. Oh, if Mary were but known, there would be no coldness to Jesus then. Oh, if Mary were but known, how much more wonderful would be our faith, and how different would our communions be. Oh, if Mary were but known, how much happier, how much holier, how much less worldly should we be. And how much more should we be living images of our sole Lord and Savior, her dearest and most blessed Son? And I'd like to read also this prayer that came from St. Alphonsus at the end of his introduction, and it's a prayer to the Blessed Virgin to obtain a good death. Mary, sweet refuge of miserable sinners, when my soul is on the point of leaving this world, O oh, my most sweet mother, by that sorrow which thou didst endure when assisting at the death of thy Son on the cross, assist me with thy mercy. Drive the infernal enemy far from me, and do thou come and take my soul to thyself, and present it to the eternal judge. My queen, abandon me not. Thou, after Jesus, hast to be my comfort in that terrible moment. Entreat thy beloved son in his goodness to grant me the grace to die clinging to thy feet, and to breathe forth my soul in his wounds, saying, Jesus and Mary, 
I give you my heart and my soul. Wow, very good. And I think there's no better way to end this show than to say a prayer to Our Lady ourselves. So with that, we'll say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. St. Alphonsus Liguori, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. This is the Children of Our Lady podcast, brought to you by the Catholic Family Podcast. Until next time, God bless you, and Mary keep you.